Hi, this is Mark at Skywagon University, and today we're going to look at what looks like a very common or garden paper, but actually it's a pretty rare one. It's a paper Arrow 3 Turbo with a normal tail. So let's have a uh, closer look at it. So the differences between this and your regular Arrow, the Turbo Arrow 3, written on it, a bit of a giveaway, the Turbo Arrow 3 it was made in 77, 78, 89 and 90 10 year gap not a lot of them made they have the turbo io360 continental in them turbo injected opposed 360 cubic inch six cylinder so a little bit of history of arrows from the beginning middle of 67 they made the arrow out of a cherokee 180 they had a 180 carbureted engine in it retractable and it was the piper arrow 67 so in 69 they put a 200 horse in it and it was the Arrow 2, still got a square wing, still got a short fuselage. Halfway through the production of that 200 horse IO360 Lycoming four cylinder Arrow, they stretched the fuselage and made the Arrow 2, but it's still a Hershey bar wing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so it was just the Arrow 2 because it had the Archer's fuselage and not the Cherokee 180's fuselage and it had the wider tail, which we'll look at later. <clears throat> but this further wide, this much wider on both sides. Then the Arrow 3 came out and there are two Arrow 3's. One is a tapered winged 200 horse Lycoming low tail, normally aspirated. And the other Arrow 3 is the Turbo Arrow 3, which is this which is low tail, rare, turbocharged continental six cylinder engine in it at 201 horsepower and obviously fuel injected. And that's this plane, but people automatically assume when you see turbo arrow three, that it's a T tail. So the T tail is the arrow four. Arrow fours were turbo T tails. Arrow 3s, people want this engine and they want this combination because it's like a Mooney 231, high altitude, fast, cross country, but they don't like the T-tail for whatever reason, then you've got to buy this plane. So there's a lot of differences in them. And when you got into the 3 and you got into the tapered wing, that's the tapered wing is the difference between this and a Hershey bar wing. And the Hershey bar wing, Hershey bar is a delicious, delicious chocolate bar. Sorry always. The uh, Hershey bar wing is just a square parallel sided wing that was on all the Cherokee 180s, 140s, early arrows. And when they put the tapered wing on, on the three, it's the Archer Warrior Turbo Arrow 3 wing. And it's a little bit longer and it has a slight more cuff out towards the tip. So it's a bit more docile and it looks nicer. So there is an AD on the spar of all those wings. And we'll have a quick chat about that. So before we have a look at the wing AD and the tapered wing and the spar, uh, there's another thing I wanted to quickly point out. The front of a continental powered arrow is a bit narrower, sleeker, wider, different cowling, different intake. So it's a bit more sort of pointy on the front end. And this obviously the airflow is here and on Lycoming it's not. And on the, it's got the intercooler scoop on the other side. And then so a Lycoming powered arrow has a one piece cowl top that you unlatch two latches on both sides and there's two pins in the front. You lift the back up and then you take it off in one piece and the whole engine's exposed. And that's the same cowling as archers, arrows, um, Cherokee sixes. This turbo arrow, this piece stays and this, this, this is metal, not fiberglass. This will lift off like a sort of little clamshell and comes off. So it's a bit of a different cowling on the front. They've got these louvers on them. So the turbo continentals are like this and the Lycoming ones are more like an archer. So let's go under it and have a look at the uh, the wings and the spar AD. So here we are under it. This is a little plastic cover. It just unscrews with three screws here and it just slides off. And there there's eight bolts. Two, 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 two. And you undo the outermost two for the AD. And then just put the plastic cover back on when it's done. So enough of this lying around on the ground. Let's have a look at the rest of it. So a quick funny story. When I first did that AD, I had it done. I called up Aircraft Spruce and I'm like, yeah, I need the, uh, the, the bolts to hold the wings on a Cherokee 6. You know? And the lady said, yes, that'll be $2.60. And I was like, no, no, they hold the wings on a Cherokee 6. She's like, yeah, they're $2.60. 
And I said, well, how much for the nut? She goes, 40 cents. I said, what? I'll have 20. So I bought a load of them so I could do other ADs. But imagine that, a wing bolt holding on. There's eight of them per side, top and bottom. And they're $2.60 each. Something finally in aviation that isn't five grand. But once that AD is done, so you do it at 4,000 hours, factored hours, not 4,000 hours total time. So you apply a formula that the AD that gives you, which you add and subtract and multiply the times, the numbers, numbers of 100 hour inspections it's had. And by the time you finished, like this plane is 3,500 hours away from needing that AD because it's by its factored hours, it's only got like 1,300 hours on it, but it's actually got 3,000 something total time. So once you've done it, you don't have to do it again. And once it's done, you get a certificate that goes to the FAA, another one goes to Piper, and one stays with the plane to show it's done. And it's actually such a cheap and easy AD to do that people do it whether they need it or not, just for safety, because it's done. So general sort of geeky info about the wing. The tapered wing on an Arrow 3 Turbo has a fuel tank of this size. If this plane was a um, Archer or an Arrow 2, it would be this size. So they hold... 36 aside when you have these three bays in the Archer, Arrow 2s, Warriors, it's a 50 gallon tank, so there's 13 more gallons per side in this wing, and it, all it does is use up one more bay. So the tail, if you say Arrow 3 to somebody, they're going to think T tail. So we talked about that. This is a low tailed Arrow 3, of which there are only a few hundred ever made. The T tail. The horizontal stabilizer, this exact thing is up there, and there's some inspections on it, and it's nothing to do with safety or structure and thing, it's to do with the feel of the plane when you take off. Because it's out of the blast of the rushing air of the propeller on takeoff, the elevator's only being subjected like 60 miles an hour wind rather than 150 mile an hour wind from the prop, so you've got more elevator authority. But in the air, the T-tails, it's doing the same speed as if it was down here, so they feel fine in the air, it's just, it feels slack on takeoff, and you've got to wait for an airspeed before you can lift the nose. But for some reason, the psychology is that there's a preference for these lower tails. And on the tapered winged Warriors, Archers, Arrows, they have this extra piece. So a Cherokee 180 or a Cherokee 140, the tail is this wide. There's a seam here. They didn't do it in one skin. They just added a piece. So there's like 18 more inches of tail. And all of them have this. Seneca's a lot. They all have this one piece stabilator with a massive trim tab on it. Normal vertical fin, normal rudder which you can't move on the ground, obviously, because the nose wheel's on the ground, and it's mechanical, mechanically steered. So that's the story with the low-tailed turbo arrows. If this was the other Arrow 3, it would be exactly like this, but a non-turbo Lycoming 360 in it. And I went through that really fast earlier, so I just had to recap a couple of things to make it clear. So the configuration on all these PA-28s, Cherokees, is the same. Top latch, that's closed, open, it's got a little thing that clicks in and then it unclicks when you shut it. Unlike on a Bonanza where if you do that you'll bend the door, you've got to release a Bonanza. This, will, this is what you expect. Single door, same as a Seneca, that just touches the engine's nacelle in a Seneca. And then baggage, upward opening, a little latch. 150 pounds, the baggage area is a cover in there. Very conventional, no doors on the other side. All the Cherokee 140, well, some Cherokee 140s only have two seats and they don't have a baggage door. But some Cherokee 140s, all the 160s, 180s, all the Warriors, all the Archers, all the Arrows are like this. And then the Cherokee 6s and the Lancers and Saratogas and Senecas have the double door on the other side, bigger fuselage. So let's go up front and look at the engine. There's a lot under its cowling to talk about. Okay, so here it is with its cowling off. It's literally just a load of Zeus fasteners and it all comes off in one piece. It's not hinged like a warrior, like an archer. You just undo them all and lift it off, which makes it very accessible. So I want to talk about this intercooler and wastegate that these have. These engines have got a bad rap in the Mooney 231 and in this and in Seneca's and a couple other planes for having temperamental top ends and being, you know, they need cylinders replaced. This plane did not come with a wastegate from the factory. You add it. It's a Merlin wastegate and it protects the engine from overzealous jockeying of the throttle by people who aren't familiar with turbochargers. 
Um, this one has it. The other thing is turbos heat the air up. They thrash it till it's high compressed, it's compressed and it's hot and it goes into the engine hot. And now the engine's hot and the cylinders get hot because of that too. So you put the wastegate on to look after the, the manifold pressure limits and you put the intercooler on to keep the air cooled and we're going to follow the air through this plane and see where it all ends up. It all ends up very sadly at the end being burnt. However, it comes in here through this scoop, up this duct, over the top, and then we're going to go around. And then blasts through an air radiator and then out into the cowling. So all this is doing, this air coming in is blowing through the induction air. So the induction air that's being burned in the engine is coming in here, going through an air filter, going up through this pipe into the turbo, being pressurized and heated by default, then shoved into the inside. So imagine, the, imagine in a car, the water, there's water and there's air. In this, there's air and air. So the air is blowing through it to keep the air inside it cool. So the turbocharged pressurized air is now inside here and goes down this pipe. It goes in, gets cooled, comes out, and then goes into the induction and then gets split and comes down these two induction tubes, which normally, like well, normally in a Lycoming perhaps, would be underneath. So the air goes in here and then the fuel comes and the spark comes and the fire comes and you light it. But this, every 15 degrees, that the intercooler cools the air after it's turbocharged, but before it gets to the engine, is an inch of manifold pressure that isn't shown on the manifold pressure gauge. And you think, oh, it's only an inch, who cares? Well, if you were at 10,000 feet, the intercooler will be cooling the air 60 degrees, roughly. There's a, there's a gauge in there that shows the intercooler cooling temperature gradient. This will be cooling at 60 degrees. Well, 60 divided by 15 is four. So there are four inches of manifold pressure not shown on the gauge at 10,000 feet. So if you want 34, and you're at 34, it's 38. And even though this plunger can go to 46 inches of manifold pressure, that's too high. So you reduce power to maintain the same manifold pressure as you climb. It seems wrong, but you're getting more efficient cooling. So the air is denser, so you can climb. So if you want 30 inches, if you want 34 inches, you show 30 on the manifold pressure gauge, and it will really be doing 34 because the intercooler. This cold air, cooler air being forced into the induction system will keep the heads cool and it's just a big plus and there is another video on this channel all about intercoolers but i can't half talk about intercoolers because here is one and i want to explain how it works so you need a merlin wastegate and you need an intercooler to look after the turbocharging so more detail on the engine we've been through all the intercooling and, and the wastegates oil cooler is here so the air comes in under the cowling and is forced out the bottom of it here the air gets forced in a lot of places in here forced through the oil cooler forced into the induction system for the intercooler and then obviously out underneath so the way this is designed is obviously three and three flat six io tsio 360 turbo injected opposed 360 cubic inch continental and they have individual valve covers for intake exhaust intake exhaust intake exhaust so the six per side this is the fuel rail for the fuel injection primer lines spark plug leads induction and this is a cross a cross flow engine so the air comes in the top goes in gets burnt comes out the bottom and goes away a lot of engines it comes in gets burnt, goes back out the same way. These can, they breathe more freely because it's on top, like the modern IO 550s and the Cirruses have the same thing as this. So it looks very complicated and there's a lot of wires and cables, but it isn't really, it's just visible. A lot of this would be underneath the engine. But 18, when this was an F engine, when it was new, a TSI 360F, it had a 1400 hour TBO and it didn't get there. So the conversion then is to make it into an FB, which is the fix. And on the data plate, it says TSIO 360 F C FB. And the C is converted to FB. So that extends its TBO to 1800 from 1400 hours. And it gets there if you look after it, especially if it's intercooled and it's got a wastegate on it to protect the engine from the jockeyings of the pilot. Other than that, very conventional, hot starts, cold starts, everything the same. Fuel consumption is about, uh, you could make this engine burn 11 gallons an hour. I mean, it's marginally more than the Lycoming, but it'll do it at 20,000 feet if you can go up there and breathe at that altitude. But very, very efficient, fast. This plane, the main competitor for this plane is a Mooney 231. So retractable, 
modern wing, turbocharged Continental. The 231 is probably a bit faster because it's a Mooney, but these are fantastic planes and it's very Cherokee. It's very arrow. It's very familiar. Whereas a Mooney might feel like it's too slippery or hard to get into or unsure. This plane isn't. This plane is very much a Cherokee from the firewall back. It's just got this big, uh, well, not big. It's only 210 horse, 201 horsepower still, but it's just this more complex continental head. Vents on the cowling. Why? Well, what you do is, say you've been on a high, hot, fast flight and you don't want to vapor lock it and you want to cool the engine. When you're at the, the gas pumps, you can open these, open that, open the other side, and it'll cool the top of the engine down and, and it won't vapor lock your fuel lines in the injection system. They normally stay, that one isn't, but they would stay there and, you can, and it just lets it breathe. Because if you have vapor lock in your fuel lines, you're gonna have a hard start. On a, on a on a turbocharged um, injected engine. So that's what that is. So nice, right? The engine, the time, the paint, the interior, the leather, it's good. Check out the panel. You will not believe what this plane has in its panel. Not a vacuum system in sight. These are Dynon HDXs. It's basically almost everything that a Garmin 1000 is, or a G3X, but it's Dynon. So the only problem is they're not IFR, even though it's got synthetic vision, it's got, I mean, it's even got the gear, look, three greens for the gear, three greens for the gear. Each one can do what the other one does. This could be totally engine, this could be totally engine, this could be totally nav, this could be split. They do everything, comms here, altimeter, audio panel. To make it IFR, all it needs right here these have comms in These are comms, so you don't need a third comm. What it needs here is an IFR GPS that isn't a comm, like a Garmin 335, a Garmin 400, something that you certify IFR, and the whole plane becomes IFR, and then you can use this stuff. And if I'm getting that technicality wrong, let me know in the comments, but um, my understanding is that to make it IFR, it needs an IFR GPS. But look, custom panels, Everything's been redone, avionics, master switch. You got manifold pressure and tack and fuel flow here. You've got oil pressure and oil temperatures here. You've got gear switches here. Here's your um, speed. Here's the altitude, synthetic vision, the map, synthetic vision. If we taxi onto the runway, you'll see the runway on this screen. It's just very, very modernized. And the plane is a 1977. So they would have just been, you know, a stack of king and a load of gyros and a vacuum pump. So a very, very nice upgrade for somebody who wants all the features of a modern plane, but not pay a million dollars for it. This is $170,000, this arrow, and it's low time, and it comes just like this. So it's, a, it's amazingly well equipped. So enough chat about intercoolers and turbochargers and gear and engines and things. Let's um, take it up and take it around the pattern. So everything's on. I do not fully understand how to use these and I'm not going to be demonstrating them, but they're on uh, enough to have me fly it around the pattern. This is the temperature differential cooling gauge that shows the amount it's being cooled. So at the moment the engine is, the intercooler is cooling the air 7 degrees. Just here, you don't have to do anything about that now, but in flight you do. Okay, the run up. RPM, 1700. Left mag, right mag, left mag, both. The voice in the headset saying electrical is telling me that the alternator is slightly overcharging, which is something to know. Rock. Just like a regular arrow. Electrical. Goals. Gas, left tank, the fullest. Over the runway. Okay. Ten degree flaps. 
Placerville, Arrow, 793, Actual. departing 23, Placerville, local. Electrical. Watch the runway coming to view here. Powerful pressure is at 25, which is good because going around the path. RPM. 2400. Kingdom traffic, 19897, left downwind for 30, Kingdom. Very much a Cherokee. If you've flown all the Cherokees, you've flown arrows, you've flown warriors, archers, in the air, apart from being faster and turbocharged, this is very, very like those. Incredibly familiar. You've got to get checked out on these two, but there's a big deal right there. Doing the pattern here at 23, 2400 RPM and 21 inches of mouthful pressure just on downwind. We're burning uh, 11 gallons an hour. I think that Bonanza 153 Zero Whiskey is uh, 6 miles straight in, 3 zero, full set. So we're well below the airspeed for gear extension, so I'm going to lower the gear. Actual. Pump. Three greens. The greens are here too. <laughs> Bit of connection today. Inter traffic, uh, 198 left base for 3-0. Uh, incoming traffic, uh, going to be a full stop, back to back. Placerville, Cherokee Arrow 793 is on left base for 2 3 at Placerville. East maneuvering, Willis. Flap arc, 10. Placerville, Cherokee 793 is on uh, left base to final, full stop on 2 3 at Placerville. Kingdom traffic, 19897 is on uh, base final full stop 30 with a taxi back. Kingdom. Kingdom 1530 is about uh, well, that's all miles. We'll overfly and turn out for a left over. Little arrow pointing at Placerville on there. Wind here. Full of traffic off the north, turning down with three four. <laughs> Not as good as the Bonanza, but if you can use the plane again, it can't be that bad. So I barely used the turbo, it took off a little bit of turbo, but I didn't use it all the way down when base final, so there's no idling and cooling on the ground because it's already been at a massively reduced power setting. So we can just shut her off. But there it is in the pattern, a very, very nice 77 Turbo Arrow 3 with the Continental and the wastegate That's and cool. the intercooler. So, we survived the flight. Excellent plane, had a bit of a look around it. Very rare, remember they're made in 77, 78, 89 and 90. Turbo Arrow 3 
with the low tail. The four is the T-tail. So thanks for watching it. This is a rare opportunity to get in a plane like this because we've never had one before. Um, and thanks for watching. We do a lot of these videos about uh, different models and different types as they come in. So this was a nice chance to do it. So if you liked it, Skywagon University, subscribe on the little link. There's a bell you can click on for notifications. And thanks for watching. Thank you.